Well, this is Pastor Alan Jackson, and I am delighted today to welcome our guest. John DeBerry is the senior advisor to Governor Bill Lee. He served in our state legislature for more than 20 years. Um, He has been a voice for reason and truth in this state for decades. So we are honored to welcome you back, John. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's truly a privilege. There is a a method to this today. We've been through a difficult patch the last two or three weeks Mm -hmm. in Tennessee. And I couldn't think of anybody that could speak to what's going on with more experience and authority than you. Um, I know there's other things, but a school shooting just a couple of weeks ago, I think, didn't just shock all of us. It was a tragedy that was almost unimaginable, where somebody from the trans community went into a Christian school intentionally looking for Christians Mm -hmm. and targeted children, and there were six people murdered. Yes. Um, it's, It's almost unimaginable to think that that was happening in Nashville. And then to see the way the media covered it and diminished the fact that the Christians were the targets and really tried to create an empathy for the trans community as having, it was almost as if the Christians had created the problem. It was, and the way, um, there were several reports that I saw, and 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 we're, we're not making this up, because anybody that wants to see it can Google it, and they can see it for themselves. The fact is that when it was reported, it was reported in such a way, as you said, to build empathy for the shooter, while at the same time saying that the victims were fair targets, that because of some of the laws that have been passed in the state of Tennessee recently, that uh, this made... Uh, us worthy of this type of attention uh, from the shooter. And in in reality, just to clarify, the laws that the governor and the legislature passed was to protect minors from medical procedures that would mutilate them physically or alter them for the rest of their lives. They're so young, they can't legally buy a beer, but we were giving them permission to physically alter themselves. It was mutilation. Yes. And Vanderbilt acknowledged it was a because it was so profitable, they were interested in it. Right. And and when we think about the fact that we hear all the time from psychologists, from physicians, from sociologists, from those who know the human brain, that they've said over and over and over that the brain is not even fully developed until one is in their early 20s. Why in the world would we alter permanently permanently alter a prepubescent child who is not old enough to say when they're going to go to bed, but they're old enough to make a claim as to whether they are a boy or or a girl and then be altered permanently uh, so that whenever they do finally, by God's timetable, realize uh, their, their gender and what they're going to be once they reach puberty, that they've been altered uh, permanently. And, and it's an awful thing when you think about what's going on. And then to call it health care, to say that we are refusing health care to trans, uh, trans children, that's not health care. Like you said, that's mutilation. And there, the, the bill was not doing anything that was diminishing trans, the transgender population. Not at all. They were just trying to protect the children from decisions that they weren't prepared to make yet. That's exactly right. We, uh, as a, a ordered society, as a society with empathy, we have to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. We have to fight for those who cannot fight for themselves. This is the reason why you and I have been so vocal against abortion for so many years, because we're fighting those children, fighting for those children who don't have a voice, where they, they should be in the safest place on earth, under the in their mother's womb, under her heart, but 63 million of those children have been uh, slaughtered, have been thrown away like human garbage because of the law. When we see the law out of place, when we see the law violating God's law and God's commandments, it's incumbent upon people like you and I to stand up and fight for those who can't fight for themselves. Amen. That's good preaching. Yes, sir. You know, and there are some people that would say to us that we shouldn't pick up these topics because they're political. 
And I, I couldn't disagree more. We're, we're not talking about politics. We're both ministers of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And our perspectives are emanating from Scripture. That's right. You know, God said that he knows us when we're knit together in our mother's womb. So the parents may not know that child yet, but God does. God does. And he has a plan and a purpose for that child. The Bible says that God created us male and female. God's the one that established the the institution of marriage. The government didn't do that. That's right. And so when we pick up these topics, there's no intent or desire even to be engaged in the political realm. We're trying to remind the people with the biblical worldview, a Judeo-Christian worldview, That's right. that this isn't up for us to negotiate away. That if we imagine so right. ourselves to be Christ followers, we have to acknowledge and own that biblical worldview. That is so right. And I'm sure you, as well as all of us who have spoken from time to time to the people, have used what God said to Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 1.5, I believe it is, before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. God has said, over and over in the Hebrew scriptures that all souls are mine. And so therefore, if children are God's heritage, if all souls belong to God, if God knows us even before he forms us in the womb, how dare we go against the law of God and say that that's not a person, that's not a human being, that that's not viable. And and when as you said earlier, uh, as as gospel preachers, we can't say uh, and make a determination as to whether or not a person is a person and then have them legally killed, but the law can. The law can, which is why Paul said, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You're not fighting people. But he says, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world. A group of men in their robe, sitting at the Supreme Court in 1973, with, I believe, one woman at that particular time, made a decision, and that decision has cost the life of over 63 million children from that one decision. You and I don't have that power. We, We don't have that power, but because they had the law under their control, they did have that power. Well, I think that's where the Christian community has underestimated the influence we have. We have a voice and we have to use it. We have to use it. I know you and were, in, were involved with the civil rights movement in the 60s, you and your father and your family. But the moral authority for that came from Scripture. Mm-hmm. And they used that authority to hold our nation accountable and our leaders accountable. And we saw the laws be changed to line up with the authority of Scripture, that every person, regardless of the color of their skin, should have equal treatment before the law. That is exactly right. Dr. Martin Luther King, who was the most visible spokesman of that era, I I met Dr. King on many occasions. My father introduced me to Dr. King. Um, I, I, I can say that they were friends to where my father showed up at many of the marches to where he and they became familiar with one another. Uh, but... One of the things that I know for a fact when I look at them is that they made a decision that America was worth saving, it was worth changing, and it was even worth dying for. Dr. King said over and over that he was a patriot. He quoted the Constitution. He called the forefathers our forefathers. And one time he even said that we're going to live together as brothers or we'll die die together as fools. And he said that in the late 60s when there was so much turmoil in the country. Basically, what this man was trying to do was say to America, live up to your promise. We're Americans. Since the Revolutionary War, people of color have fought in all of the wars. They have spilled their blood on battlegrounds just like everybody else, even coming out of World War II with the Tuskegee flight and all of those who gave their life for this country. They loved this country. My dad loved this country. My dad taught us the Pledge of Allegiance. When I went to the first grade and said the Pledge of Allegiance for the first time in a classroom, I already knew it because my dad had a flag in his office and he made his children say that pledge. Before we lost our home in fire, he had his a Korean War era uniform hanging there prominently for us to see, for us to understand that this is our country, 
that we have responsibilities and that that um, and he raised us so that we would contribute and give back to a country that he said had given him so much. That's a wonderful heritage. And you have repaid it with your leadership in our state for decades. And I thank you for that. Well, thank you. You know, watching the current events, uh, it seems to me that one of the tragic outcomes that is becoming um, prominent and frequently embraced is the marginalization of Christians. Yes. When that Christian school was attacked mm -hmm. by someone who clearly was at least emotionally unstable, mm -hmm. there was a tendency to want to blame the Christians that somehow they had brought that up on themselves. Mm -hmm. And that kind of marginalization or dehumanization is a very frightening it step is. to me. It makes all of us targets. It does. And having lived in a culture where you were treated unfairly, I imagine that there's some parallels amongst all of that. What do we say to that when we see it happening again now? Well, I, I think what I appreciate so much about working with the current governor is he approaches from a holistic standpoint. He approaches problems with permanent solutions. He says, I've heard him say a thousand times, we want to solve problems that will stay solved even after I leave office. And so, therefore, we talked about mental illness. We talked about not just dangerous weapons, but dangerous individuals. And uh, so, we, uh, we understood from our conversations that we had to do some things that would protect the community. Having said, having said that, uh, the, the, when I look back on what I experienced as a child, when I think about the times when I was called a slanderous name. I remember getting on the bus and walking to the back of the bus with my grandmother there in Memphis, Tennessee. I remember going to the water fountain. I really couldn't read at that particular time, but I could see the difference between that white porcelain uh, fountain and that silver fountain that had the cool water dripping off of it, and I wanted some water from that fountain, and my grandmother would not let me. At that time, I did not understand, but one thing she did was she did not allow me uh, to uh, develop some type of um, um, a malice about the issue. She bent me over and she pointed, and I think I told you this once before, she pointed to the pipe coming out of the wall. She said, she called me Nick. She said, Nick, you see that pipe coming out of the wall? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you see it going to this fountain right here? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, she said, you see it going to that fountain right there? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, get your water. It's the same water. And uh -huh. so we can go. And, and that's what I appreciate about my family. They never allowed us to develop hatred or malice, or even prejudice, if you please. What they taught us was how we deal with what we had to deal with then. You know why? Because my father said, this is America. Things will change. Mm -hmm. And he and others went about the business of changing it. We need that courage today. Yes, but I think the governor did respond to that school shooting with some tremendous courage. He really there did. There were all these cries to do something, and you all did do something. Yes, you passed sir. a bill to make our schools safer, all the schools in Tennessee. That's right. And the governor, you know, the idea that he did that as a response to the shooting, he had been grappling and wrestling and suffering and agonizing over this the entire year that, that the session has started. Since January, he's been trying to get a bill passed that that will make the schools safer, that will protect the children, that will protect folks' Second Amendment rights, but at the same time, make sure that dangerous individuals were not having access to guns without certain safety measures. He's been wrestling with that the entire year. Finally passed a $155 million bill that will make the schools safer. That's because that's who he is. That's who he is. And he, he um, as I said, he agonized over the death of those children as though somehow 
why couldn't we have gotten this done quicker? And I could see it on his face uh, as he almost teared as he talked about those those victims and especially those nine-year-old children. So we have a man in place who um, uh, empathizes with what's happening in society and, and wants to do everything possible to make it better for everybody. Well, I appreciate the courageous leadership that you all are demonstrating, not only for our state, but for the nation. Now, that tragedy was sufficient, but on the heels of that, we have had a lot of confusion in the state legislature. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that, you know, the media didn't really want to talk about the story about the Christians being targeted or who the perpetrator of that was. And then the events in the state's legislature have enabled them to change the narrative and almost right. sweep that under the rug. But you understand this, I'm sure, far better than I did. You've lived in that legislative body for decades. Help us understand what was happening and if it was appropriate or inappropriate. Or In 1995, I walked on the floor of the House of Representatives as an elected member of that body. I had a background of civil rights worker. I had uh, done all types of things to help change society and make society better. But when I walked on that floor in January 1995 and I raised my right hand and I took that oath of office, I stopped being an activist, a civil rights worker. I became a legislator. I became a legislator. And because of that oath of office and because of the confidence that the people in District 90 had given me, I had a responsibility to sit down, talk with folks, black, white, male, female, Democrat, Republican, rich, poor, uh, all three grand divisions, and work out legislation that took care of the people of, of the state of Tennessee. I took that responsibility uh, seriously. I took it with great pride, and I did everything I could uh, to make the state of Tennessee a better place, understanding that it wasn't about me. It wasn't always about what I wanted or my thoughts. I was there as a representative. As a representative, I represent the people of the state, not just the people of my district, but I represent the people of the state of Tennessee. What we see happening when folks refuse to follow rules, refuse to live by protocol, refuse to adhere to decorum, refuse to work with their colleagues and uh, say all types of things that give the improper and wrong and fraudulent perception of the House of Representative, Re Representatives, as well as the government of the state of Tennessee, as well as our wonderful governor, I'm offended. I'm offended. And what happened on that day had never happened in the 200 or so, 240, I think, year history of the state of Tennessee. It had never happened. What if they had walked with a bullhorn while the governor was doing the state of the state? What if they had walked with a bullhorn while you were preaching on a Sunday morning or while a judge is presiding over a courtroom or uh, in some other public uh, fashion? It sends the message that we reward bad behavior. Right now, we have teachers who are sitting in classrooms they cannot teach because there are children who know there are no consequences. They can cuss the teacher out. They can be disrespectful, disruptive, and every student, in a classroom that's disruptive and disrespectful diminishes that teacher's ability to teach by 25%. So imagine if he or she has three or four of those who have been taught from their homes that they don't have to obey the rules. Well, that's what happened, and we're sending the absolute wrong message in rewarding that bad behavior. So for the, the person listening that wasn't paying close attention to the news cycle, they disrupted the state legislature. They Maybe took it. over the floor. Procedures had to be completely stopped. The gallery was filled with people that they had cooperated with planted. putting in place. They had mm -hmm. planted in there. And the, the media has cast it as if it was about guns or gun control, but it was really, that wasn't the point of the objection. It was about the, the legislation protecting the children of Tennessee from the mutilation that we talked about. Right. 
So right. they shut down the state legislature, breaking all the rules of right. order and policy, which right. they had agreed to uphold. Right. And 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 when when we when we go back and look at it in retrospect, we have to ask our ourselves then what what type of people have we become? What what about our nation? Where are we heading? Where are we going? How do you have a ordered society without rules of order and without folks obeying those rules? Everybody understands and understood on that floor, going all the way back to the formulation of the Black Caucus, if you please, in the early 70s. And and since the 70s all the way to this day, African-American men and women have sat on that floor, have fought battles, that have they have passed major legislation. They have changed this state by their courage and their ability to work across the aisle. Lois DeBerry was the chair of the Rules Committee for years, and uh, the rule, many of the rules that they broke were made by bipartisan uh, committees of folks uh, of diverse backgrounds. So here again... We've got to ask ourselves where we're headed as a nation if we're going to just simply allow folks to break the rules and reward them. They're now national celebrities. They're a national figures. We've had major politicians who have come to uh, to lift them up before the public eye. And, and in the meantime, the little nine-year-old girl who is truly a hero, who put herself in danger to pull the fire alarm so that other kids could get out and lost her life. Now, that's a hero. That's a hero. Those teachers, that janitor, those are heroes. Three nine-year-old babies lose their life, and we're talking about some rule breakers who bum rush with a bullhorn the floor of the House of Representatives. Amen. Well, that's a great point, and I am a consistent advocate that I don't want to focus on the knuckleheads and the ne- negative things, yeah. but to try to recognize the good things that are happening. I think we live in a great state. I think we have tremendous opportunities for people from all segments of the culture in society. Um, I think the leading with character such as you have done bears fruit over decades, so I think we have to celebrate some of the good things happening in Tennessee. You have a unique seat to see that. This leg- the legislation that's been passed to protect our schools, all the schools, right. not just the public schools, right. all private schools. schools as well. That's right. That's not differentiated by color or economics right. or all the children and families will benefit. The legislation to protect our children from the mutilation and the greed of some health care workers mm-hmm. or industries. Mm-hmm. A lot of good things happening in Tennessee our budgets are good. Our leadership is good. You can celebrate some of those blessings. You know more about it than I do. Well, Tennessee is a great place to live. When we think about a succession of governors who have been good businessmen, have been progressive in their nature and making a, a wonderful business environment, and the governors that I have been associated with, from McWhorter to Sunquist uh, to uh, Bredesen to Haslam uh, to now Governor Governor Bill Lee, uh, Each of them took the state just a little bit higher to where now we have one of the best business atmospheres in the country. This didn't happen by accident. To give the idea that there is some type of plantation on Capitol Hill where folks don't have the voice and that folks don't have the ability to represent their people and represent their district, that is a false narrative. And and, and I'm sorry, I'm offended. It's a lie. It's a lie because folks have sat on that floor and fought to make Tennessee a better place. And we have so many successful people uh, of of all uh, diverse groups, male, female, and all diverse groups who are making a wonderful living in the state of Tennessee, which is why so many people are moving to the state of Tennessee because it's such a wonderful place. We've watched Nashville explode. That didn't happen by accident. It happened because we are a wonderful place to do business, a wonderful place to live, and we have wonderful leaders in this state. Do we have our faults and failures and flaws and fallacies? Yes, we do. But we also have our faith, and it is our faith that makes us step back 
do an introspective examination of ourselves, and if we find flaws, then fix it. That's what we've done over and over and over again, like any other group. We, when we find something wrong, we endeavor to fix it. We don't get on the floor and fight it out and, and beat each other up and talk about each other and call each other names. We go behind closed doors. We sit down at the table like men and women of decorum, faith, and common sense and find a, a better way to do it. Amen. Thank you for your leadership in our state. You know, it just reminds me that if the people of faith, if God's people will recognize the influence that we have been entrusted with, mm -hmm. and we'll have the courage to stand up for what is right and what is wrong and to tell the truth, that God will continue to bless our state and our families and our churches. We do have a role to play. We do. We can't step back from the culture. We have to take our, our what we learn on the weekends in church buildings and step into the culture with that truth. That's true. And make a difference. That is so true. Um, I remember the night that Dr. King made his last speech. Mm -hmm. My mother allowed me to go. She none of, the, none of the rest of my family went, but my father and I went because it was uh, common knowledge that Dr. King's life had been threatened. And my father wanted to be there. He wanted to be there for support. He wanted, you know, whether the, uh, he wanted his face to be seen. And for Dr. King, excuse me, to know that he was there. I can remember watching his face as he looked around the room. If you go back and you watch that speech, it's, it's different from any other speech that he had given. When he said, I have been to the mountaintop and I have seen the promised land, it sent chills through my body because I'm looking at a man who somehow was thinking, I may not leave Memphis alive. I may lose my life here. He could have sneaked out of town earlier in the day, and nobody would have known it. As a matter of fact, there were law enforcement and others doing everything they could to protect him. And he could have left, but he didn't. He stayed. He, he put himself on, on the line. So when I see folks say that those that are breaking the rules, those who are refusing uh, to follow protocol, those who are calling people names on the floor of the house, that they are the face of courage, they're the face of courage. If they want to see the face of courage, go back to March 5th, 1968, and watch that man make that speech. That's the face of courage. And that's the type of courage that the next generation needs to look upon. My father and others who join hands saying we shall overcome and walk down the streets of Memphis. That's the face of courage. Standing up and being insulting and disrespectful and disruptive, that doesn't take courage. It takes courage to sit down and talk to each other, man to man, eyeball to eyeball. Now, now that takes courage. Amen. John, thank you for your leadership in Tennessee. Thank you for your influence in the body of Christ and for the courage you have demonstrated on our behalf over several decades. Thank I think we ought to close with a prayer. Yes, sir. We need God's help. Father, I thank you for the place you have planted us. Lord, you chose this. And I thank you for John DeBerry and his family and the leadership they have provided in this state for decades. And I pray for the church this day. Lord, may we have the wisdom and the courage to stand for your truth, to show a love for all people, but to be willing to stand for what's right and wrong and to not step away from the truth of your word so that we might simply be embraced more fully. Awaken your people. May we yield once again to the, your authority in our lives. May we choose holiness and purity and righteousness before you. Look upon us with mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. John, thank you for your time and for your leadership. God bless thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. 